Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Regional Transportation Committee meeting of Regional Council of Governments for Tuesday, November 15, 2022. My name is Kevin Flynn. I'm chair of RTC this year. We are going to convene short of a quorum, but we're going to postpone our action items until we have a quorum. We're about three short right now, I think. So I call the meeting to order. Uh, the first item is public comment. It's one of the reasons I wanted to convene right away in case people are online wanting to. But let me ask, do we have any folks in the hall who want to offer? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I will give it a second just to make I don't see any public comment at this time. Thank you. Uh, no public comment. We'll move on to item three, October 18th, RTC meeting summary. I hope folks have had a chance to look at it. If anyone has any uh, corrections or errata to offer, let me know. Seeing none, uh, we'll accept those. Uh, let's skip over four and five, uh, the two action items, and we'll go to the informational briefings. If that's, uh, are we all set for that? Corridor planning program and community-based transportation plans. Attachment D in the packet. If people are watching online, it's attachment D. Download the the agenda at the Dr. Cog website. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, okay. everyone. I'm Nora Kern with Dr. Cog staff. Um, actually, Nora couldn't be here today, but we've hired Nora. She's our new senior mobility planner. She's actually here to launch both of these programs, and we wanted to give you an overview of these two pilot programs. Thank you. Today. So let me start with our corridor planning program. Um, this really has its roots in our 2050 regional transportation plan. As you all know, because we worked shoulder to shoulder together for two years, first to develop and adopt the 2050 RTP back in April 21, and then we just spent the, line, the last nine months revising uh, the 2050 RTP to address the greenhouse gas planning standard. There are you know, some real commitments in terms of what we call project and program investment priorities in the plan. We were very intentional together as a region about setting priorities for major investment in this region through 2050 in the plan, working together. So the idea of this corridor planning program is what can we do as Dr. Cog to actually directly sort of help implement some of those investment priorities in the plan. We all do great work together in terms of corridor studies, project implementation, things that we work on together as a region. Our idea is that as Dr. Cog's staff, we can actually take some of our staff time, some of our planning funds, and actually directly um, help implement, start the journey on some of these corridors um, that for whatever reason haven't gotten started yet or need some additional resources or need some help to get going. So really, we would lead some planning for some key regional corridors in the 2050 RTP. Um, I call this sort of a first step planning process. If you think about the project development process through you know, a visioning study, PEL, NEPA, um, there's some variations on that. This would be kind of the beginning of that journey. Again, those corridors where we've identified investment, but we just kind of need to get started with those first visioning or, or planning first steps. Um, identifying multimodal investments that can be advanced towards implementation. Um, again, helping the region advance the goals identified in the 2050 RTP. Part of this as well, the last bullet, is tracking planning efforts on all the great collective work that we're doing as a region in terms of the status of corridors. What are all those different corridor studies and, and activities going on in corridors? So we're creating an interactive map. I'll show you a static version of that in this presentation. So we put out, so again, this is a pilot program. So pilot program to us means we've never done it before. We don't know what we're doing. We're figuring it out as we go, and we're giving it a try. Very so, reassuring, Jacob. <laughs> Thank you. So um, we started with a solicitation uh, for letters of interest for the quarter planning program. Uh, we did those back in October. I think that's right. Yeah, we did those back in October. Uh, we received uh, four submittals. Uh, four letters of interest. Our selection panel is actually going to meet today um, to kind of work those, through those to see if we can make a selection. Um, the idea is that we're going to try and do two kind of close together, um, either side by side or very close together. One is through the solicitation process where we reached out to local governments in the region and said, hey, do you have a corridor that you know you could use some help with? Um, so again, we got four of those. And then there's one that's going to be a Dr. Cog kind of staff-led uh, reflecting on the priorities in the RTP. We're going to pair those together. Uh, we're going to go through them, and we're going to see what we learn. Um, in terms of sort of the pilot program process, starting out, we identified some overarching priorities. Local jurisdiction buy-in is important. The idea here is that, Dr. Cog, we will dedicate our staff time and some of our planning funds towards this. 
We're going to partner with a local jurisdiction. We want that jurisdiction to dedicate their staff time, uh, sort of an in-kind contribution, their kind of staff resources to work side-by-side -side with us in partnership. Um, obviously, we're looking at regional impact. Obviously, we're looking at what's in the plan and reflecting on the priorities in the plan. And a little bit here as well, readiness and um, RTP staging period. Remember that our projects and investments are staged over the 30 years of the RTP. So we want to be intentional about those commitments that we've made and advancing those commitments towards implementation. We also identified some other priorities around advancing equity, building out the regional transit network, addressing safety concerns as outlined in our regional vision zero plan and in our 2050 regional transportation plan and expanding multimodal transportation. And most, frankly, probably all the corridors and the major investments in our plan, as you all know, are multimodal in nature, and that's the focus of the corridor planning effort. Um, so roughly close to 60 eligible corridors in the plan, whether they were explicitly identified as corridors or just major projects or investments that, I, that were identified in the plan on those corridors. Um, as I said, we released calls for letters of interest at the beginning of October. Um, those were due October 31st, and we're working through those, as I said, this week. We're going to meet um, as a panel to see if we can make an initial selection. And then I mentioned the map. This is a static version. This is a prototype. It's a work in progress, but we're getting close. Uh, we're really taking all the information that we're aware of, um, local government-led, CDOT-led, RTD activities, things that we're working on, and putting this all together into a map so that it'll be an interactive web map. I think really useful for us as professionals, you all as stakeholders, but even just the public, to be able to just go and sort of click on a corridor, what's happening on federal, what's happening on Colfax, and just be able to understand the status of studies or project implementation on these major corridors in our region. So let me pause there for a second before I switch gears to the community-based transportation plan, just see if there's any questions or comments on the corridor planning program. Rick White. That's right. Uh, Jacob, how do you define what a major corridor is? So um, it's really, you know, we start in the regional transportation plan with what we call a regional roadway system, which, let me see if I remember, major arterials, principal arterials, and um, there's one other. Um, but it's really sort of those major arterial, and, you know, we also obviously have freeways in the plan. Of course, this is not a freeway-based um, project. This is our major arterial program. So it's, you know, it's all of the major state highways, non-state highway major arterials that we know and love. But that's kind of the universe of... Uh, where we're looking at for this program. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Go Thank ahead. You, Mr. Chair, so let me keep going. The community-based transportation plans, um, another pilot program. This is a little bit different. Um, I'm going to read through the program goals. I usually don't like to read slides, but it's important, and, and I want you to understand what we're trying to do here. Uh, we identified some program goals, but the big thematic thing here is that we want to meet people where they are in vulnerable communities across the region. It has been an unfortunate historical legacy that sometimes, you know, folks in those, in those areas, those populations, don't hear from people until you want something, right? You know, we're going to implement a project, we're going to do something, and that's when they hear from us. We want folks to kind of hear from us just on their own terms, where they are, so that we can understand together what are the needs in those communities. Um, you know, obviously we're going to focus on transportation, but we want to understand just in those populations, in those communities, what are your needs and how can we help? So improving mobility options for low-income and historically disadvantaged communities in the Dr. Cog region, identifying needs. We're going to start with two focused communities through the creation of the community-based transportation plans. We want to, again, we're going to try and do two together as a pilot um, over the next year or so identifying implementable projects or programs that could address the needs of focused communities. Um, again, obviously with a mobility and a transportation bend, but we want to hear from those communities, even if it ends up being things, you know, projects, programs, services, investments that Dr. Cog, you know, may or may not provide or may or may not fund. You know, again, this is going to be a partnership. We want to hear from the communities and find out what do they need and help connect them to resources. That's something that we're really good at at Dr. Cog together in partnership with you, um, connecting them to resources or dollars or things that um, can help those communities based on what their needs are. Um, developing, let's see, yeah, developing new practices for engaging low-income and BIPOC communities and grassroots community-based organizations. That's something that I know all of our agencies have been working on. We've been working on that at Dr. Cog both internally equity within our own organization, but just externally as well. How can we better engage with folks that we don't typically engage with in the transportation planning process? 
and then building relationships with grassroots organizations representing underserved populations in the Dr. Cog region. We envision this as a partnership. The solicitation that I'll talk about in a moment that's out right now is geared towards local governments, municipal governments, but in partnership with community-based organizations, um, non-government NGO-type organizations that we want to work with in partnership, um, those who really understand, know, and work in those communities. So uh, what is a community-based transportation plan? Um, again, pilot program, so this is our first time doing this, but we think elements of the plan could and should include community engagement, identification of transportation needs, challenges, and barriers, discussion of possible programs or projects, as I said, to address those needs, recommended strategies, actions, or next steps, focusing on low-income people in historically disadvantaged communities and their specific transportation challenges. And we really gave this... <clears throat> Excuse me. We really gave this a lot of thought in terms of our solicitation about how do we define these areas? Is it geographic? Is it population-based? You know, what's the right way? What's the best way to define these populations? We ended up saying in the solicitation that because it's geared towards local governments, local governments know their communities best. We want to hear from local governments in your community uh, what are either the geographic areas, the populations, the areas or the people of focus um, that we should be attuned to in this program. Um, so again, in partnership, we want to hear from local governments about um, how to how to understand and how to work with those communities. Um, but again, you know, sort of some thematic things, centering low-income people and people of color throughout this planning process, prioritizing equitable community engagement, partnering with community-based nonprofit organizations, as I said, in plan creation. So um, again, historically marginalized groups and disproportionately impacted communities in this region is really the focus of this. Um, jurisdiction buy-in, just like the corridor planning, here's one area of similarity. We're bringing Dr. Cog staff resources and some planning funds, but we want to work in partnership uh, with staff and resources in, in uh, local governments and communities. Um, Community-based organization buy-in as well, planning need and potential for regional collaboration. On both of these programs, we want to learn things, processes, partnerships, activities that can be transferable across the region. Um, so timeline for this one, we released the um, calls for, we're calling them letters of nominations. We released those on November 1st, um, giving a long lead time here, uh, both because of the importance and the complex nature of the program and the holidays. Um, so this we do in mid-December. Um, and then as we get into the new year, uh, we'll uh, select our first community, um, put in place the contractual arrangements um, and the things that we need to do to get this kind of started um, as well. We've also built a web page. It's on our website. Uh, where there's more information as well as the um, letters of nomination for folks who are interested. So with that, I'd be happy to answer questions on that program as well. Thank you. Questions? Uh, Director Williams? No, I'm on. There you go. Yeah. Jacob, are you looking at statistics like available public transit per head in in this study because there are places in the greater Dr. Cog region that do not have a lot of public transportation that um, maybe don't necessarily pop to mind based on the criteria that I saw. Yeah, that's a good question, Dr. Williams. I will say we haven't thought specifically about that statistic, so I appreciate you raising it. In the big picture, though, again, we started down the path of could we define these areas? Are they transit poor areas, are they some other type of characteristic? And again, we decided too, too complex and probably not the right way to do that. So we want to hear from local governments, what are those areas that you're interested in? You know, we're asking in the letters of nomination for local governments to actually sort of justify to us, why are you, why are you wanting to work on either this geographic area, this population? But when we get started on that study, I think that's absolutely germane in terms of things that we could look at um, as part of what's going on in that community and what's needed in that community. For sure. So thank you for that. Director Ricks. Thank you, sir, very much. And first of all, thank you all for coming today. I know it's crazy out there. Kind of, oh, there's Jessica. We now have a quorum. That's the only reason I wanted to get the mic. To say that. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, thank you very much for showing. Uh, what I did want to say with regards to this program, we're really excited about this. This is different for us. Um, you know, I think we're really interested in working with NGOs and, and establishing those relationships throughout the region. Um, ironically, we actually 
heard about this program when we were staffing the RTD Accountability Committee and some of the work that's being done um, across the country. I think San Francisco, we, San Francisco does, does a lot of this. So we, we were very keen on that when, when we were researching that we thought this would be great for us and it's a good opportunity for, for us to you know, establish those new relationships. And we're really excited to work with our member local governments and as well as you know, CDOT and RTD and making sure we're, you know, the access to mobility is there and opportunity. So thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, seeing none, thank you, Jacob. I think what I'd like to do, although we have a quorum now, I would like to do the second informational item and then we'll move on to the action items so we're not jumping around and confusing people right up at 5.30 in the morning. Doug. <laughs> Thank you. Jacob, can you do the next one? Yes, sir. Um, Transportation Planning Framework and RTC Committee Guidelines. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is a two-part item. These are two related items that we're going to discuss. The first is what we call the transportation planning framework document. Um, and then related to that, we've been looking at our committee guidelines at Dr. Cog for several of our committees, and we want to have a conversation with you today about the Regional Transportation Committee committee guidelines. So let's start with the framework document. For those who have been around a while, um, you may have known it as the prospectus, but we're not trying to sell you mutual funds, so we don't call it that uh, anymore. <laughs> um, it's, its formal title used to be Transportation Planning in the Denver region, really rolls right off the tongue. We've shortened it to the Transportation Planning Framework, but the intent of the document is still the same. The punchline is that it's really meant to be a Transportation Planning 101 uh, for you all, for the public, we even use it for new employees. I think there's sort of a wide, diverse audience for this document, but it's really meant to demystify and explain in plain English what is our multimodal transportation planning process in this region. And in particular, hearkening back to our federal requirements, our 3C, let's see if I remember those, continuing cooperative and comprehensive planning process that's required of us by federal regulations with the agencies in this room in our three-legged planning stool of Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD. And it's actually been staff from those three agencies that have worked on this document together, um, again, to explain our planning process and our major products from that process. So it describes our policies and procedures together. Um, it details how our three agencies work together in our planning process and, as I said, our planning products. Um, and it shows how the regional planning process dovetails with um, our individual processes that are each of our agencies, local governments, air quality conformity, um, some of the other partners that we work with and the other issues that we work on together in our transportation planning process in this region. It's also referenced one of the, it's not a federally required document per se, we're one of the few MPOs in the country that we're aware of that do something like this. Um, but it does have some utility because something that is federally required is an MOA between our three agencies that's required by federal regulation that really talks about how our three agencies work together to implement that 3C process. We have linked that MOA to the transportation planning framework because the framework describes um, that 3C planning process. So I'm not going to go over all the individual elements here, but it's a multi-chapter document, although it's not very long, but it really just kind of talks about who we all are, what we do, our committee structure, which is the link to the committee guidelines that I'll talk about in a minute, um, coordination with other transportation processes, things that we do in each of our agencies. Each of our agencies has state and federal requirements that apply specifically to our agencies um, that we work on together as a group, so it talks about those as well. Um, so last time we updated this document uh, was back in 2016, early 2017. So we've really focused on, you know, some things are, are sort of timeless in our transportation planning process, but as we all know, a lot has changed in the last six years or so. Um, so again, I won't go through all of these, but um, these are near and dear to all of our hearts. We've worked on these together over the last few years. So we really focused on updating the document, both for sort of federal requirements. We, you know, we were, I think we were at the... Um, Doug, do you remember back then when we worked on it, we were, was it Safety Lou way back when? And now we're up to the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, we have all these state requirements, the greenhouse gas planning standard, the Front Range Rail District Board. So a lot has changed. So we've really worked on just sort of updating the document, um, but we've also done a real refresh of the design of the document. And I really want to give credit both to our transportation planning staff and to our communications and marketing division for their work um, on the document itself. 
Um, so that's actually it on that piece of it. Uh, we're providing it as information. It's in your packet. We encourage you to take a look at it. We will bring it back to you probably early next year for adoption, but we wanted to get it in your hands now just so you could see the updated document, uh, give you a chance to absorb it. I'd be happy to answer any questions now before I go into part two, uh, but again, we will bring it back to you for um, adoption early next year. Thank you, Jacob. Any questions? Uh, Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a comment on this. I mean, it is a wonderful resource document. I Listen, this is the fourth MPO slash COG that I've been a part of, and we didn't have this kind of resource at any of the other places I've been. It does. It's a great, I mean, certainly someone that's new to the region, it was a great, great um, read. Oh, I can't believe I just said that. It was a great read. But it was great to understand the complexities of this issue, right, of, the, of this region and um, and the various players. I will say, you know, Jacob alluded to this with regards to the Regional Transportation Committee, the RTC, and how unique this is. Um, this doesn't exist in many places around the country, and I think it speaks again to the collaborative nature of this region, and um, it's especially on a, on a wintry day such as this, it's nice to have people in a room to be able to talk about this stuff. So, um, yeah, it's great. Please read through if you, if you get an opportunity. Um, I think some of the updates are really, really good and much needed. So thank you, Jake, Jacob and staff. Thank you. It is a great read. The movie didn't quite live up to it. But. <laughs> Any other other questions, Director Williams? Someday. I've only been coming here for years. Um, I, I'm happy to see that no alternates are permitted. Has been struck from this, but I personally am a, a little confused, and maybe not the only one, um, about the difference between alternates and proxies. So if I could, let me just, um, let me get to your question, because it's a good question, Director Williams, but if I could, let me just give you an overview um, on the committee guidelines themselves, and we'll get into a couple of those issues. So thank you for raising that. Kind of part two of this presentation is that within the transportation planning framework, it talks about the roles of each of the committees at Dr. Cog and our committee and board kind of adoption process, approval process, particularly for our MPO planning process. And as part of that work, as I mentioned, we've actually been um, giving a refresh, not just to the document, but to our committee guidelines um, here at Dr. Cog uh, for our several committees. Yesterday, we had a conversation with the Transportation Advisory Committee about their committee guidelines. So today, we'd like to have a conversation with you about your committee guidelines. Yours are relatively straightforward for the RTC committee, um, but thematically, there's at least kind of one major issue that I do want to highlight, and Director Williams, I'll make sure that we get to your question as well. What I'm showing on the screen is kind of the track changes of your existing RTC committee guidelines um, and the work that we've done as staff to kind of suggest um, both some updates, a little bit to format and just kind of um, programmatic um, type stuff, just updating the, the document. But in the big picture, probably the biggest thing that we wanted to chat with you today um, about the committee guidelines is that for RTC, because it's our MPO committee, the membership is really well prescribed in terms of our three agencies working together, again, back to our 3C planning process. But as you see on the screen, this paragraph that I'm showing um, is in part a rewrite of the paragraph below. So part of this is just a formatting change. But the big picture here in terms of the, the highlighted item for discussion is that we do have three other members on RTC. So part of this is talking about how those members get, um, get appointed. But the big question that we want to talk with you is those three other members, what is RTC's feeling about specifying sort of who those members are? Do we want to name those members such as RAC or the chamber? Do we want to keep that more open? Um, that's a question as we were going through this that we wanted to have a conversation with you about, you know, knowing that we prescribe the three agencies, Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD, how do we feel about the level of specificity for the other members of RTD? So let me open it there for questions and conversation. Questions? I, I anticipated that, uh, <laughs> uh, Director Silverstein. Yes, I, I am, and other members. So um, I, my question really wasn't more on the um, designation, but on the, uh, the four years. So would this be guidelines that say I was appointed um, in the future? Um, am I done? That's a good thing, maybe not. But um, is uh, is that kind of, would that be a, a new bylaw that would begin? ED Rex. Thank you, sir, very much. No, Mike, you're right. As currently written, that would be the case. Um, okay, but we don't want to kick you out the door. I, and actually, since this has been since we published the packet, um, I really 
quite frankly, don't like that sentence at all. Um, I, I don't agree that there should be a specific limit. I do believe there should be, you know, um, an annual review or something of the membership of those members. However, I would argue that um, that the RAC is one of those members that should be specifically indicated, designated as a standing member for, for, for this group. That would be my recommendation. My recommendation would be to include RAC as, as a standing member and to strike the four-year consecutive deal. Thank you. Uh, Director Conklin. I, I just want to echo that. I believe RAC absolutely should be a standing member. I would also like to see RAC added to the standing reports so that we get that in. Uh, CDOT and, and I appreciate that uh, all the all the comments and and it, not for um, my selfish reasons but as an organization I think it's an important uh, element of the RTC it has been for a long time it brings um, you know a good perspective to quality and climate are are so closely tied that uh, it's important to uh, take the recommendation of the executive director and, and those others commenting. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Director, I don't know who was first. Director Shaw. Thank you. Um, I would also like to say that most organizations have term limits on their own merit. Um, so it seems to me that term limits could be within those uh, organizations themselves. I don't know if that's the case with the RAC, but pretty much every other board that I'm a part of, the members who serve on the board are subject to term limits from whatever their originating agency is. So I'd like to remove the term limits as well. Thank you. CEO Johnson. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm good. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and good morning, and thank you very much, Roger, for the presentation. Recognizing there's been conversations relative to the representation, one thing that I would offer up, recognizing the intersection with transportation with key elements, i.e. housing, land development, economics, and the environment, we should think in terms of having representation, because for not, we could be at a disadvantage when you think about access to those things as we look upon development in future years. So I would sort of encapsulate those different elements as we talk about having appropriate representation. Thank you very much for the opportunity to opine. Thank you. Commissioner. Uh, uh, Thank you. I want to follow up with what Director Johnson said. Um, I would urge that we, on the other stakeholders, have the widest possible political orientation. I realize that as transportation people, we're non-political, but especially after this last election and the landslide, a lot of people are feeling that they're not part of the process. Therefore, I think it's important that you reach out to Chamber of Commerce, to developers, and pe perhaps people that may be on the other side of things so that they can be part of this as we move forward. There is a sense that uh, Denver controls everything in Dr. Cog. Uh, I live in one of those outlying areas up by Rocky Flats where people are not as uh, excited about the Dr. Cog thing. And I think if you draw in people, and I know further south too, there's some of that. Uh, it's important at this particular political moment. Thank you. Thank you. If I had a 10-foot pole, I wouldn't touch that comment with it. <laughs> and, and by the way, that's why I'm making it in this intimate group right here, because it's important that we reach out beyond perhaps the traditional thing. We're trying to reach different uh, economic groups now, and this is a good time to reach out so that we have the biggest tent possible. Thank you. Could I get uh, maybe Doug and make sure I understood? Uh, and Director Shaw's follow-up. Um, I would like to discuss the issue of term limits, not term limits, but terms of office. So if, uh, if a member, uh, a partner member is, is appointed for, say, four years, at the end of that four years, there would be a, a, a reconsideration or, or a new person could be brought in. Doug, do you want to? Well, on the, on the standing membership, um, those are appointed by each individual. Oh, on the others, the other members. Um, I'm not sure I understood the question. So, I, I'm thinking about, you know, not to 
not to get personal about it and no reflection on the person, but I'm thinking about uh, Jeff Coleman, for example. For example. Yeah. Uh, and at what point uh, would we uh, appoint someone else or would we say to Jeff, uh, thank you for your service or, uh, or have an open process for other members of the uh, transportation planning community could apply? Right. And now having said, saying that, and I've known Jeff for 35 years. Indeed. I have no complaint about. It. I'm just saying there's no there's no point at which we reconsider uh, that seat. Right. So that that's what I was referring to. Oh, indeed. But um, you know, the proposed language does does allow for an annual evaluation of that membership of the other members, right? Um, in absence of any type of term limit. Now we can obviously put a term limit in, but I I just it's it's. It's the situation in which, like someone like Mike Stoverstein, gets lost in that, right? Obviously, yeah. we still, you know. So if we can agree on what standing committee members we want, right. and just the other members being, you know, ones that you know are not are not long term or are not standing members, then we can, you know, we can figure that out for sure. If you want to do four years, we can do four years. Uh, Director White. No, I, I, I can. Yes, I'm confused. Um, what is meant? Which agency annually in January? That's just Dr. Cog. Okay, so that annual check isn't doesn't happen currently. Uh, Director Hapsdorf. I was I was actually just going to get to that point. So. I know it's a little confusing the way this edit language is, but just to ground everyone in sort of what the current state is, the agency memberships are established by those agencies that have set membership. We ask them to do that every year. We're kind of formalizing that a little bit in terms of setting the time frame so it all happens consistently. Um, the executive director of RAC has historically been one of those other members for a long time. There has been no existing language about sort of how to review those other members. And so we have had cases where folks have been on for a really long time, which is neither good nor bad. It just felt to us like maybe we should formalize some language around the other members. So I think what I'm hearing is some consensus among around the table about making the executive director of the RAC a standing member of RTC, so that would take that would take that seat out of the other members. I think the follow-up question becomes: for the other members, do, does that now reduce that to two, or do we retain that at three and have three additional other members? We have so I'll just for grounding. So Jeff Coleman sort of was appointed to the RTC, sort of in his role of representing Move Colorado, which is a statewide transportation advocacy group. Um, so that's been a really good voice. People. Um, I think if we had some sort of renewal process or sort of um, maximum term uh, years of service for those other members, I think we would seek just to replicate that. The other um, member uh, under the other members category has, uh, has typically been a representative from a chamber of commerce. Uh, most recently, that was the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce. And when that individual left that agency, it was kind of right around the time of COVID or shortly before, and we just didn't get around to sort of replacing. And again, there was nothing in the IRTC guidelines that said those other members would be reviewed every year. So kind of at least formalizing that and prompting that to happen. But I think to, to sort of just talk about sort of that other, those sort of transportation advocates, business representatives, that has been sort of the focus of those other, other members. Thank you, uh, Dr. Williams. In, in keeping with General Manager Johnson's statement, um, we are a different group in that we are also the state capital. Um, we represent nine very diverse counties and transportation underlies everything. It, it really ought to be a social determinant of health. And in the world that we live today, um, I'm, I'm all about climate change and the RAC and happy to have Mike here all the time. But I think that we would do ourselves a disservice if we don't broaden some of the participation, maybe bicycle groups, I don't know, maybe housing authority, other agencies that have input into transportation issues and needs. 
in our region. Um, and I'd like to keep Mr. Silverstein permanently and still have three others in the interest of diversity. Thanks. Commissioner Stan. Thank you. I agree with Kate, and um, I think it should be three extra. And I think you should go beyond the traditional, like Kate said, bicycle groups, pedestrians. What's on the other side? Freight, heavy industry. Get somebody in there that's not traditional. And the reason is get them into this because we're all kind of from the same group, really. And we need to be more diverse and respectful because the roads and, and getting people off the roads and improving the truck uh, emissions, which Rebecca is heavily involved in, uh, if you get them at the table, you'll probably have more luck than talking to them through the Denver Post. Thank you. Anyone else? I just I want to put a finer point on this question and get some feedback. So the current language is it is it is up to the three executive directors of the three partner agencies to come up with a proposed candidates for those three other seats. And those are um, agreed by the. So the question for you all to consider and what we'd appreciate some feedback is do we keep it that way so that now that we're adding sort of an annual review of the other members and the three executive directors determine sort of what the right mix of those that slate of bring forward do you want to offer some examples in the guidelines to say such as kind of these interests just to give a little bit of guidance but not completely tying the hands of the executive directors or do you want to specify representatives representing this interest, this interest, and this best as your staff, that maybe that's too confining and might not give sort of some flexibility to adapt to sort of changing issues over time, right? And, and trust the executive directors to make a determination about sort of what the right mix of representatives their voices. Thank you. So is that the direction for uh, staff? CEO Johnson. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Pastor, for that clarification. I do support that. I wouldn't want us to hamstring ourselves, recognizing that um, times are ever changing and we have to become more flexible and agile as we go forward. And um, I will take that on with my team um, if that's the um, consensus of this committee as we go forward. So thank you very much for sharing that. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, uh, Director White? Uh, just to follow up on some of the other interests that have been raised, how how would you all like additional feedback on that? I think that the motor carriers has been raised, bicycle groups. Do you want us to continue to brainstorm on that, or does the, Dr. Cog want to come back with some ideas and solve later? Are you talking about the list of examples or we might have in there? Or other um, representatives? We can consult offline on that. Okay. We get into the final packet, so we'll reach out okay. to both both you and our team. Okay. Station. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I have one more point of clarification ahead. I'd like to make, so because I'm not quite clear. So, on the are we removing the four consecutive language in the in the last line there, and just keep it at as um, to evaluate annually? Thoughts on that? Uh, Director Conkle. I, I would think outside other appointments, it's something there unsaid and new people. Uh, obviously, for the partner agency, I, something like that to give. give all the help in in right. others yes, I, I i i don't mind having the um you know that you know some sort of language on on it's and 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 the reason why is that um you know i think you know unless it's my predecessor at the rack 
years. Um, I don't intend to be here that long, and uh, <laughs> nor would you want me. So, um, you know, <laughs> right. but thank you for the, the, the vote of confidence today. But, um, you know, this is the hardest thing an organization does is look inward and make these, you know, have these conversations and make these decisions about structure and, and uh, format and organization. And um, the, the, the hard work we do as, as, as committee members, I think, is, um, is important. But when we look at the, at the structure, we have to kind of remove our personal interests and our selfish uh, nature. And um, I, I could imagine that if we have other members and we do an annual one-year review, that's a hard conversation to say, thank you very much, but we need to bring in somebody different. Uh, I think we get natural turnover with um, members and CDOT members and so forth just because of the nature of the positions. But um, these, you know, the other members from the outside to have some, whether it's it's four years or, or some other number, um, you know, I, I think it's okay to have that because it, when you want to have, change it up a little bit, but if somebody really wants to stay, how do you, how do you, well, that person no, and that that's that's a hard conversation. We tend to avoid those things. So that's just some um, thoughts on that term limit piece. Director Shaw, I would just ask logistically. Let's say that we add freight and chaffa and and for public library or library associates of America or something, if they even exist. And we find that the library people are really not a good fit for the group um, by saying four consecutive one-year terms. Are we limiting ourselves to removing the library group after two years and adding in you know, someone else? I guess I just want to make sure that by that this might not become a promise of four years um, for someone who is doing a good job, but who may not be, whose organization as another partner might not be a good fit. That would be my only question. So, Mr. Chairman, yeah, I, Go ahead, Doug. I think the, the proposed language actually answers that question. I mean, I think it, it is an annual appointment, right? And it's on upon unanimous uh, recommendation of the executive director. So there will be a, an evaluation of those three members annually. So in your case, that that library representative, if we agree, oh, it, it's not really appropriate for this group, then someone else make a recommendation. Thank you. Just to clarify, Doug, are you saying uh, an annual appointment, but not a four-year limit? or remove the four-year limit? Where, where? Well, I think I'm hearing to keep the four, four consecutive one year yes. in there. That's what I thought also. I just want to make sure. Yeah. All right. So I think the language as proposed, I think everybody is in agreement with that. The only change is that we make RAC a standing member. Okay. That's a standing member. RAC would not have. Correct. Correct. And potentially specify at least some ideas around those other members. I think that's yes. what I'm here yes. to do. Hey, okay. any other questions, comments? Mr. Chair, one more element to this, if I could, if we're yes, ready. Go ahead. Okay. Um, and I want to get to Director Williams' questions. The only other change here, that was the major thing that we wanted to discuss. Um, as Director Williams alluded to, there is a section around use of alternates. So let me get to that. Um, so we're proposing to cross out about each agency designating annually in writing to the chair. Uh, standing alternates. Um, and also, we had a clause in here from before, no alternates are permitted for the other members. Um, and so that's, I think, a point of conversation. We wanted to ask you that question as well. For contrast, for a transportation advisory committee, we had this conversation with them yesterday. Uh, they have alternates for each of their local government members. We have seven, by the way, at least we're starting with seven special interest seats on Transportation Advisory Committee. There was some talk yesterday about maybe slightly expanding those to nine or 10, uh, but each of those special interest seats has alternates. So we thought it was, frankly, as staff, a little bit of an odd clause here, um, no alternates for other members. So we wanted to talk about with you how you feel about that. Should every sort of member and representative of RTC have an alternate, or do we want to limit that to the three agencies? So let me open that up. Discussion? Director Mikkelbus. 
morning. I think the interesting piece of the conversation yesterday was the concept of an at-large alternate member. And I wasn't quite sure how that would work, but it seems like if you had several agencies or several partners that, and three of them couldn't show, do you have maybe a couple folks that are at large or do you have local government in, members? Yes. Yeah. Potentially. But just put a finer point, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, if I may, just put a, a finer point on that. I think because the suggestion was at the TAC, the Transportation Advisory Committee, is that the, um, um, the sub-regional forms would make those selections, so they would operate basically the same way as RTC does. I mean, each agency, they have their members, but you also have a, a pool of alternates, and any of those alternates can represent any of the members. Not one to one, so I think that was kind of the concept they were looking at attack yesterday, which I think makes a lot of sense. And I personally, I like this strike. I just think that you know stuff happens, right? And it's all about, I mean, really, just be honest about quorum too to make sure that we get the every people here. Ron. I don't. Need, I don't get. It. Um, <laughs> So on the other members, so for example, uh, Director um, Silverstein is currently a, a appointed other member. He is not allowed to designate an alternate. So when he's not able to make an RTC meeting, we just don't have a representative. But we heard from you is the other members will be designating those, those members, hopefully representing some agencies. But for example, if the Colorado Motor Carriers Association uh, kind of executive director were appointed as an other member for just for example and if we strike this language that member would be able to designate an alternate for themselves so if they weren't able to make an alternate but well we wouldn't have a pool of alternates for the other members it would be an alternate for each of the seats unlike how the agencies are structured um, in the other part of this where RTD gets to they have their executive director and three board members, but then they can have a slate of alternates that sort of is a pool of alternates. So whatever um, regular member is not able to make it one of them. Dr. Source. Um, maybe a, a good idea might be that um, to allow uh, the other to have alternates, but that the alternates um, are appointed. So motor carriers, for example, couldn't appoint somebody that's not in motor carriers. That to someone, you know, maybe in some smaller, more or more unique organization, as an at-large position. Well, if at large, and it's just somebody who's hired um, from transportation planning and had a great career. What, are they, what alternate alternate would they have? That that becomes but if at least maybe some language that says it, that the the alternate should come from, should maybe come from the immediate organ. Thank you. Let's have uh, let's ask staff to come back after hearing this discussion. Come back with something that we can see in writing and react to that encompasses all the all ideas that were put on the table. Uh, Dr. White. I'm going to be a a little bit vulnerable here and admit I, I have actually been a little bit confused of my alternate role until reading this and I wonder if there's a an opportunity to provide some more clarity so the way I understand this now that I see this is CDOT has four representatives at any given time right we could have up to four alternates okay but but, but. Okay, I, um, I don't know that I'm thoughtful enough about looking around the room when I vote or not vote, wondering in some cases I probably shouldn't be voting if. <laughs> we, we keep, we keep We're track. Doing We're doing that for you. You do that, yeah. okay. So we I don't would, need we, to, yes. you don't need any extra clarity there. Okay, oh, yeah. so you would, disregard my vote when, okay. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> All alternates are voting, but then we they decide which vote counts. <laughs> Good work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other discussion? <laughs> Seeing none. Mr. Chair, last little bit on this. Thank you very much. 
just to bring this home, the last section responsibilities, really this is just some language cleanup, but to bring this home and, and put a bow on this, uh, we make reference to the transportation planning framework document um, in the committee guidelines for RTC because, again, this committee is the embodiment of our federally required 3C transportation planning process as documented in the framework. So that's how these things relate to each other. And with that, I think that's all. Um, so really appreciate this feedback and conversation today. We will come back to you probably early next year with a revised version of this. This will, um, both of these, both the committee guidelines and the transportation framework document will come back to you for a vote in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jacob. Other questions, comments? Great. Very nice. Thank you. Mr. Chair, just real quick. Sorry, so, Director Conklin. Quorum is 12 and also voting things have to have 12 votes. So am I, I guess I'd never realized that before. So it's, it's not just having a quorum, but that this group pretty well needs to be unanimous unless somehow we have members be on the quorum. Okay, I just fucked that out, I guess, for my own <laughs> benefit. Thank you. I feel you. <laughs> so, and and just, just for the committee, so final recommendation and, and action by the board in revising these guidelines is to essentially add one additional seat. So right now there are 16 members of RTC. 12 is the quorum. Um, get a calculator. Um, so I think if we want to retain the three quarters requirement for a quorum, if we increase the membership by making RAC executive director a standing member, other members that will increase the membership to 17. Uh, three quarters the quorum would increase. Thoughts? Doug? Well, we don't have to change it. I mean, we could leave it at 12. I just wanted to provide a little bit more background as to why that, that provision is in there, because I asked when I came. Um, it, it has to do with, I think it, they want it truly to reach consensus of the three partnering agencies on anything. They didn't want any dissent amongst the members at the time. Now, I'm not suggesting that that needs to continue that way, but, but that was the reason, at least as explained to me. Anything else? Seeing none, Jacob, thank you. Right, we're going to jump back to... Uh, Action items now. Uh, item four, uh, 2225 TIP policy amendments. Thank you, Josh. Mr. Chair. Um, so we do have 10 proposed amendments to the Transportation Improvement Program. They're listed in a table on your packet. Um, I'm not going to run through each individually, but I just wanted to give kind of an overview of this uh, new table format since this is different from how we usually present this. Um, so we're hoping that this is a bit easier to read than the previous kind of sentence-based structure. Uh, really in those right-hand columns, calling out what funding is new to the project and what funding is being transfer transferred from an existing project in the TIP over to the new project or vice versa. So just to use the first project as an example, uh, for the Six and Wadsworth interchange, uh, this project would be getting $60 million in new legislative funding from the state, and also $5 million would be transferring from the Region 1 faster pool uh, to this project. So the third row down, you can see the Region 1 faster pool where that $5 million is then being transferred out. So we'll probably continue to refine this table uh, in the future, um, help to make it more clear, but hopefully this uh, makes things a little bit clearer. And if anyone here has any questions or if there's any confusion about any of it, of course, always happy to answer any questions about any of these projects. Um, but with that, um, I do have a proposed motion available for you. Um, and of course, again, happy to take any questions there may be. Thank you. And this was approved by TAC yesterday. Yes. Questions? Everybody have a chance to look at the list? Thank you. Someone make a motion for me. Director Williams. Or, uh, Shaw. <laughs> Thank you. I move to recommend to the board the attached project amendments to the 22 
five transportation improvement program. Mr. Stanton. Uh, second, and thank you very much for changing the format. It helped me. <laughs> thank you. Yes, it's very, very digestible. Any discussion? Any comments? Nope. All right, let me call for a vote. All those in favor, please uh, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Please say no. Attentions, hearing none. This is approved uh, by at least 12 people. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, but that was fast. Uh, last action item is uh, number five, uh, fiscal year 22-27, uh, tip call three recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so once again, um, up here to explain all three of the four projects that we have ongoing. Uh, unfortunately, we are not done yet. We still have a call left to go, uh, but certainly just wanted to start with a very brief overview of sort of where we started and where we're going to end up. Um, so a total of $466.4 million um, was identified over federal fiscal years 22 to 27. Um, we have split this up into four calls for projects throughout two TIPS. Uh, we have completed the first two calls already with action that the board took back in September um, to program, program those funds into our current 22 to 25 TIP. And again, those were for air quality and multimodal projects only. As we move into calls three and four, uh, this, these will be programmed into a new TIP that we are developing co covering federal fiscal years 24 through 27. Um, as we go through the, uh, today's presentation, this will be for the regional call or call three, and uh, we'll actually conclude today. We'll kind of outline the steps that are going on currently um, for call four. So a little bit more detail about the call three. Uh, we had an, a call that was open for eight weeks from October, August 22nd to October 11th. Um, this did contain two tracks. So very much in, uh, in line with what we had for calls one and two for air quality and multimodal projects only. Once we did get to calls three and four, we've expanded eligibility and added a new funding type for surface transportation block grant. When we did this, we essentially split it into two individual application tracks. Um, very similar to call uh, one and outlined in our TIP policy. Uh, each forum was allowed to submit up to three applications to Dr. Cog for consideration, and then CDOT and RTD were also allowed to, to submit up to two. And again, the, the, the table that you see here outlines the available funding for call three, but further defines it by year and by funding type. Total of 19 projects were submitted, as you can see on your screen here. Uh, we did uh, put these onto our website and also indicated the subregion that those applications came from in addition to the applicant and which track they submitted that application within. So once all those applications were received and we posted them, uh, a dozen Dr. Cog staff went through and scored each application, each question within each application to develop a average score for each, um, for each application. Um, that was based on a, a range of zero to five, five being the highest. Consistent with calls one and two, a new process that uh, we initiated. Right here. Sorry, folks, I did not know that. I was just talking loud, so there we go. <laughs> um, the individual scores from Dr. Cog's staff, in addition to the public comments that were received, uh, were um, handled over to a project review panel. 
Um, this project review panel is made up from one technical member from each of the eight individual subregions, uh, a member from RTD, CDOT, and also three subject matter experts. Um, this panel met twice the week of October 31st um, and received, again, like I said, received those scores and those individual comments. They were tasked with developing a recommendation for each of those two individual tracks, again, the air quality multimodal and the STBG track, in addition to um, developing an overall wait list. So this is the, um, the recommendation from the project review panel for the air quality and multimodal track. Their recommendation was to fund four individual projects. Um, as you can see in the project recommendation column that's highlighted kind of sort of in gray right there and with the red text. Um, the first three projects were pretty straightforward funding the full amount. There we go. Um, the Fourth project, um, the panel recommended slightly less funding than what was um, put forth in the application, but in, in, in talking with um, City of Denver staff, they would be able to fund that scope as submitted. For the STBG track, again, um, their recommendation was to fund four individual projects. Um, I do want to run through each of these. Um, there's a little bit of a unique situation, at least with three of them. For the federal BRT, which was submitted by CDOT, um, it was funded for just over $15 million of their $20 million request. However, in discussions with CDOT staff, uh, they did indicate they would be able to fund that uh, project as submitted. For the State Highway 119 in Niwot, submitted um, through the Boulder Forum by Boulder County, um, the panel recommended a request of $6 million um, based on conversations with staff. Um, they would be able to fund the Q bypass lanes, the BRT platform, and the intersection improvements only for that project. Um, and then peaks to planes, um, the, the, the third project on this list, it would be funded with the remaining funds um, from the STBG track and the remaining from, funds from the air quality multimodal track for a total of $10 million of their $20 million request. They didn't indicate that they would most likely submit for the remaining funds within the call for upcoming. And again, the final project there, Peoria Street Bridge Replacement, um, uh, the panel recommended a full funding request. They just want to back up to the bottom of this last slide for the regional shared wait list. Um, the panel did recommend, um, at least initially, to fund the remaining projects in score order. However, they did request that they would like to go back and after the completion of call four to revisit um, the order of that um, remaining list because most likely some of these projects will be submitted and possibly funded through call four. So the, this call three list will change. So they would like the opportunity to eventually go back and look at that. That information um, with an updated waiting list will be included within the draft um, tip packet that does go before public comment and again, back to this committee. Um, so before concluding, I just wanted to run through uh, quickly sort of what those next steps are with call four. Um, it does open in just under two weeks on November 28th. So it'll be open for eight weeks, closing at the end of January. Um, once that share closes, those applications will actually come back to Dr. Cog's staff we will go through a review process, post these applications, develop score sheets for each of the individual sub-regional share um, or the, the sub-regional forums. We will turn all that information over to each individual forum. They will go through a scoring and recommendation process the month, month of February and through April. Um, at that same time, Dr. Cog's staff will be working to develop a draft document, um, concluding with a public hearing in July um, then we will work through the recommendation and approval process in hopes to bring forth an adopted new TIP document in next August. So with that, the proposed motion before you um, is moved to recommend to the Dr. Cog Board of Directors allocating regional share funds to eight projects to be included in the new fiscal year 24 to 27 transportation improvement program. Thank you, Todd. Uh Director Papstorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just did want to note for the RTC that the Transportation Advisory Committee did meet yesterday afternoon. They made a unanimous recommendation, uh, uh, the same as what is in your packet. Thank you. Took the words out of my mouth. 
We have, a, let's make a motion and second it and then have discussion. So moved, Director Williams. Thank you. Any Director Conklin. Thank you. Uh, questions? Comments? Oh, okay. Thank you, Director White. I just say it. I think it's a really exciting list of projects. Okay. Had someone had a comment. I thought there'd be a lot more on this. <laughs> All right, uh, Director Conklin. I'll think of a random question. The, the, the public comment is, is exciting that there was that chance, that opportunity. How does that play into decision making? How is that normalized so that it's not a special interest that happens to have a whole bunch of feedback or a not in my backyard type thing? Or how, how do we use that public comment at an appropriate level? Does that make sense? It, it, it does. And it's, it's a very difficult question to answer because you're correct, and that's typically how we would normally see public comment. It's, the public comment process is not scientific in any means. Um, we are definitely going to hear comments typically that are more focused in on one subject matter um, than not. Um, but I, I mean, from sitting through those panel discussions, they definitely took into comment um, you know, all the comments received and understood sort of where they came from. That was sort of my takeaway from their discussions. Director Papsar. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And we, we don't score, we don't provide a technical score, a numerical score based on the comments. The, the review panel, though, does take those comments very seriously and does consider them. But I, I am impressed with how thoughtful that review panel is in sort of looking at those, right? Um, the, those in the full context of sort of what the region's priorities are, what the plan priorities are, and the technical score of the project. So it's an important piece of information, but it's um, in the context of the overall review of the, of the application. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, let me call for the vote. All those in favor of uh, the motion to recommend uh, the uh, regional share funds uh, to the uh, for, from call three to the Dr. Cog Board of Directors, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Please say no. Are there any abstentions? Hearing none, this uh, is also passed with at least 12 votes. Uh, we have one informational item for your reference. Uh, please take the time to look over the regional transportation operations and take strategic plan in your packet. Uh, next item is member comments, other matters. Let's hear from CDOT first. Mr. Stanton. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, the Transportation Commission will be going through a lot of uh, fiscal year 23 budgeting at our next meeting uh, tomorrow and also on Thursday. And we're excited that we're actually going to be meeting with the RTD board. We try to do that every year, and um, that always is a really exciting time to uh, share some of our uh, concerns. And uh, we really look to RTD, especially now that we're embarked on this greenhouse gas reduction effort, and RTD and Dr. Cog play such a great role in that. So we're really looking forward to seeing you all. Thank you. Thank you. Director Michelbus. Good morning, and thank you for having us here today and the opportunity to comment. Just a few things going on in the Denver metro area, particularly in Region 1. So our snow fighting operations teams were out and in force around 2 a.m. this morning. Generally, we had a pretty successful um, snowstorm. We didn't have too many accidents. It seemed like people were really watching their speeds, which were before. Um, the other things going on, we've been able to kind of reemerge post-COVID. It's been fantastic. Last month, our Transportation Commission did a bus tour of the I-25 corridor all the way from Region 1 north into Region 4, and we spent some time at a couple of stops looking at a couple of multimodal um, amenities and visiting with our partners along the corridor. So that was a really fantastic opportunity to look at the needs along the I-25 corridor. Last week, we participated um, with Bicycle Colorado, and I think many of you were here in the, um, the Greenhouse Gas Exchange Lone Tree Rail Tour. 
So again, another opportunity to really be able to get together with our peers in the industry and share some exciting information about the things that Lone Tree is doing with regard to development and TDM and smart um, development. CDOT Region 1, um, in cooperation with our uh, Division of Transit and Rail, um, Office of Innovative Mobility, we're pursuing a SMART grant. Uh, we're hopeful we'll be successful with that. And just a side note, uh, Richard Zamora, he's our uh, Transportation Director for Region 2. So my partner in Region 2, he was in Region 1 for a very long time. Um, with CDOT for about 24 years, and he is retiring at the end of November. So just wanted to pass that note along because he's had a lot of service to CDOT. That is a wrap for CDOT's updates. Thank you very much. Thank Let's you. See. Thank you. Anything else from CDOT? Director, I uh, understand. Thank you. Just wanted to add, uh, you may have heard that on Front Range Rail, Andy Carcian, who was our legislative director, has moved over to be the director of the Front Range Rail. So that's a good point of contact. Thank you. Next uh, item is uh, RTD report. We'll start with uh, CEO Johnson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. First, I want to yield the floor if Director Williams would like to um, provide any input before I make my report. Okay. Thank you very much. So a couple of things. Wanted to share. Um, RTD is progressing with its fair study and equity analysis. Most of you know that we kicked that off last year. We have really done some extensive community outreach. Uh, there are two alternatives that have been circulated, alternative A and alternative B. Alternative A really is basically uh, providing lower costs. Alternative B um, is basically offering more simplistic fares, but on the flip side of that, offering greater discounts when you look at the pass options. And we had uh, robust community engagement in October, October 20th and 27th to be specific. We had a Spanish um, language meeting in addition to one in English and uh, not statistically valid, but the participation there overwhelmingly supported um, Alternative B, what we endeavor to do with our project team and staff is look at those, go out and refine refine those recommendations relative to the feedback we've garnered to make it more specific so we can address a multitude of needs from an equity standpoint and also for those that may be using the service um, less frequently. And then more specifically, a portion of that, which I know Director Williams is excited about and I am too, as we look at um, you know having free fare for youth and what might that look like um, as we go forward. So that could take a little longer as we look at how we subsidize that, but it's a very important subject especially as we look to greenhouse gases and trying to create um, habits early on so that they can continue. Um, secondly, I'd like to announce as well today, November 15th, 2022, that one can travel with their e-bikes and stand-up e-scooters on RTD. Um, there are some restrictions quite naturally, but for all intents and purposes, if there were 55 pounds, if there's not room, you know, things of the like. But I wanted to share that because that has been quite the subject, but we had to be intentional in reference to looking at our processes that needed to be updated and ensuring that our staff frontline basically knew uh, the expectation and training them appropriately so we're not uh, impacting people in a negative light. Thirdly, I'll speak to the elephant in the room, the R-Line service. We are working in tandem, and I want you all to know that we want to be intentional as we look to restore service. I'd be remiss not to state that, you know, less than four years ago, we had a derailment in the same site. So this is a little different than what happened previously. On November 4th, we did submit our investigative report and corrective action plans to the Public Utilities Commission. They are taking that up tomorrow. We are working as well with the city of Aurora, and we endeavor to resume revenue service as promptly as possible. What I will say without speaking outside of school here, that I would surmise that that would be very soon, before the end of the year. That's what I would say if I were a soothsayer. And then to end on a positive note, um, as we look at RTD, oftentimes, you know, we're kicked around just because, you know, people want to steal our lunch money on the playground. Um, but we have been making friends. And so as we talk about the value that RTD brings to the community, just on October 31st, there was a fire in Lakewood. And um, the Red Cross reached out to RTD to our bus operations. And we went and basically provided a shelter via, you know, revenue uh, vehicles being buses in the neighborhood to help those that were impacted. And then more specifically, on November 6th, did the same thing when there was that pileup 
on Highway 6. So we are trying to make lives better through connections. And with that, I will yield the floor and thank you so much for being able to end on a positive note. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, just for my clarification, uh, uh, CEO Johnson, on the e-bike issue, uh, the uh, the can the uh, holders on the front of the bus handle? Or what what was exactly the issue? Was it the weight of the the device? The weight of the device. The weight of the device, because um, as we look at our bus fleet, not all of our buses are equipped with bike racks that can support the weight. And so what the caveat is, is up to 55 pounds. And basically, if you had, you know, an e-bike with the, you know, thicker tires, it wouldn't be able to fit in there. So, I mean, deductive reasoning, but still, we needed to provide guidelines and ensure we were providing training. Right, thank you for doing that. Dr. Williams? I just wanted to thank all of the RTV staff who are, I am a, a longtime e-bike rider, as General Manager Johnson knows, who've been sneaking my bike on um, for some amount of time. Well, obviously my bike, my bike doesn't weigh 55 pounds because I am not personally capable of lifting 55 pounds. And you have to lift your bike to put it on the rack. The bikes traditionally hold two I mean, the buses traditionally hold two bikes, and all of the drivers have always been great to me, but it's wonderful to, to people to know now that they can take their e-bike, and uh, it, it's a big multimodal option to uh, everybody's nodding. Look at all you bike riders. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Brian, do you have anything to add for RTD? Okay, thank you. Uh, let me turn to uh, Director uh, Silverstein uh, in anticipation of uh, becoming a RAC becoming a standing member, let me invite you to, if you're prepared, to uh, give us a report from the RAC. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I look forward to the, this being part of the, uh, um, and the, we've, we've had at the, for the Regional Air Quality Council from time to time, briefed the RTC and, and of course, the other committees of, of Dr. Cog of RAC's work. And so um, just like to, to let everyone know that um, the Regional Air Quality Council has um, a number of things going on. Most importantly is the, um, the draft uh, air quality plan for, that addresses uh, summertime ozone is working its way through the Air Quality Control Commission. That's the state board that uh, takes action on um, recommendations from the Air Quality Council. And so the latest air quality plan, which projects that will reach our mark in 2027 for the what we call the severe ozone situation. Um, our projections are that we're going to get to attainment of that standard, which will be a milestone for our region, which is good news. Unfortunately, the plan, it's, it's a two-part plan, has a requirement to address the more stringent ozone standard. There's two of them in play at the same time, which is kind of strange, but that's, that's the federal rules. And um, this plan does not project that we'll get to the tougher 70 parts per billion standard in a shorter period of time by 2024. Makes sense that if we can, if we just can make it to 75 by 2027, you know, we're not going to make it by um, 2024 to 70. And so that's just uh, reinvigorated the RAC's purpose and mission to um, to double down our efforts to um, continue to look for uh, emission control strategy options for the region to deploy either in as voluntary strategies, best management approaches, incentive uh, ideas, or um, if necessary, regulatory approaches in the future. So that work will um, really begin in earnest at the new year to, um, to continue to explore with our partners, especially with the Air Pollution Control Division, which is part of the Department of Health and Environment, to, um, to come up with additional measures to um, improve ozone and hit the mark for both standards by 2027. So that's, that's really what is um, you know, occupying a lot of the RAC's time now is getting through this air commission process. Um, a, a new development is that um, I, an error, if as they always are found at, at the last minute, but an error was found in some of the uh, calculations and some of the uh, what we call the emission inventories, and it was in the oil and gas area, which essentially said that one segment of oil and gas is a much higher contributor than we had always thought. And um, so the state is trying to evaluate, um, and they're the ones that, that do this work for the RAC as part of our planning effort. Um, 
they're evaluating the approach to take as to um, what part of our plan advances and what part of our plan we might need to pull back and fix the map and then redo the work and come back to the, um, the Air Quality Control Commission with an amendment probably next year. And so that's, that's just developing. That's, that's um, brand new news on Friday. And, um, but it's, it's, it's out there and it's, and it's important because it, it just highlights that this is really hard um, to come up with an air quality plan that addresses every sector of our economy uh, throughout every moment of the summer uh, that uh, that we uh, we live and play and work. So, um, you know, these things happen, and um, it's unfortunate that it, of course, happens in the middle of the of the uh, rulemaking process. But it did, and so um, it, it. But it doesn't change really. The you know, this is an accounting administrative kind of thing that um, you know, especially that we're with the Air Quality Control Commission in and the Air Division um, engaged with other stakeholders now. It, it's not the solution to our air quality issues. And so that process is ongoing, and um, it's always uh, working with uh, the transportation context, trying to find ways to um, reduce um, the vehicle emissions, reduce emissions from all sectors of our economy so that we can make the progress we need to improve public health and hit the mark for the federal standards. So um, you, you, you might hear of things in, the, in these next months as the uh, rulemaking hearing comes to uh, a conclusion in December with the Air Commission. And it's just know that the, um, the RAC and the, and the Air Division and all of the partners are continuing to double down our efforts to come up with new strategies to make a difference. Thank you. Uh, questions, Director Williams. Um, Mr. Silverstein, I have um, just recently received a notice that my insurance company, which tracks my driving patterns um, and knows, it told me that I had turned it off and I needed to turn it back on. But I'm just wondering if um, the rack could work with those to, uh, when we're talking carrot and stick kind of thing, to incentivize um people to not drive through that same, they're already tracking how much I drive and don't drive. So maybe then I could get a, you know, a carrot for riding my e-bike instead of driving my car. But my point being that somebody is tracking that kind of statistic now, and perhaps you could work with them to make that um, more uh, widely accepted. Do you get some sort of reduced rate if you drive less? Is that really um, what we're, what? From the insurance company's perspective? Well, just, what it, uh, it's actually, I, I won't say the name, right? So I'm not giving anybody a plug here, but it it knows if I break suddenly a lot sure. and if I drive fast and it knows all that stuff. So I, I don't, you know, I don't know what it gives me or doesn't give me. I'm just thinking what it could give you um, is information and maybe a way to incentivize people. Great. I've heard of that, but this is a different context. So um, thank you. We'll look into it. I do. It's either State Farm or Santa. <laughs> no, <laughs> knows if you break if you break hard or it's a, my my wife has that in her in her little Jeep Wrangler, but she's retired and she drives so little that I joked with her that State Farm's going to call in a welfare check on her because it, <laughs> it never moves. She has, it's a 2006 Jeep. It's got 50,000 miles on it. Uh, any questions? Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other items here other than other items from members. Does any member have comments? Well, I'll just note that, it, and it says it on, on your agenda, but we will not be having a December meeting. <laughs> Thank you, or State Farm. Uh, our next meeting then will be uh, Commissioner Stanton. I don't want to be a dead horse, but I think in cases of snow, you should have an alternative for Zoom that you can plug in the night before or even at 6 o'clock in the morning. The second thing is, as we talk about air quality and we talk about greenhouse gas reduction, we still are meeting in person. We still are burning up ozone by just driving here. And maybe I would highly recommend that you consider every other month or something like that so that we can do more Zooming. And there are people, my colleagues, who were not able to get in today that are having to watch in a non-responsive way on your Zoom. Thank you. Thank you. 
we'll take that under advisement. I had the same thought this morning, but uh, I would I would point out that uh, I don't think anybody when they went to bed last night knew it was going to be like this this morning. There's a way, like school closings at five o'clock in the morning, to push the button and go Zoom. I saw five accidents today on the way in. So there are accidents going on, and uh, that's just a neat exposure. Thank you. Uh, I did my part by taking light rail in today. Well, I, I, might, I might just note that there are posting requirements, so we'll have to work our way around that. It was posted as an in-person. We could not go to any type of virtual meeting at that point, not the 24-hour notice. But, you know, there are ways to get around everything. So, right. and, and I don't mean that in a negative or <laughs> way, but we need to just... We just need to be prepared for that. We we have ways. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any other matters by members? It's meeting January 17th. Of, actually, the agenda says 2022, but uh, lacking time travel here, we will <laughs> let's amend that to say January 17th, 2023. Right? And with that, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>